I'm going to attempt this evening to avoid, well, well if I, I take that back. That's not going to be possible, because if I do what I said I was going to do, I wouldn't have anything to teach tonight. I was going to say that I was going to attempt to avoid any of the verses that Mom's been teaching on Sunday, but that doesn't seem to be possible, and me still be able to teach this lesson. So, oh well. <laughs> We're just going to have to do it. <laughs> uh, I don't know if any of you have been, I'm going to take my 30 seconds of uh, fame here. I don't know if any of you have been watching the Believers Convention, the Southwest Believers Convention, Kenneth Copeland Ministries. They do it every year. Um, if you don't, you should, because it's a great time of refreshing. It's got a great word. But I was personally uh, impressed by the excellent detective work that went into stealing my notes <laughs> by several of the speakers at that convention. Uh, I'm just, it's just that when the Lord gives me something and then I give him permission to share it with other men and women of God, that they're able to accurately, you know, reteach it with clarity and that it's anointed. Um, that, that means a lot because I put a lot of work into these messages. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. It's, it's one Holy Spirit. So if you're hearing from God, you're hearing from one God. Or you ain't hearing from God at all. So whenever I steal from Mama, it's nice to know that we all get robbed every now and then. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking. I'm just joking, you know. But when the, when the Lord is taking his church in a direction, he takes all those who are plugged in in that same direction. So you will see overlap. But uh, Jalen texted me the one night at the Believers Convention, and he said, Pastor Keith Moore is teaching your lesson. And so I, I watched it, and it was almost verbatim, my, my faith lesson. And uh, I was so humbled that I heard it right. <laughs> you know, Not that I was worried that I hadn't, mind you, but it's just, yeah. it's just a good bit of confirmation that someone so accomplished in the word and in faith is preaching something that you heard in your prayer time and in your study time. And it, it was almost verbatim, some of the stuff he was saying. Same scriptures and everything. I was like, okay, well, ain't the so many scriptures in the Bible anyway. But, <laughs> but it just made me feel good. That was my little pat on the back. Not because of me, because it's all about the grace of God. So my first time getting robbed, you know, mom's gotten robbed all her life. But, <laughs> well, all the ministry anyway. But my first time getting robbed, I feel like I got robbed big. So <laughs> can't do, you can't do pretty, pretty much, can't do better than that, in my opinion. So anyway, uh, we're going we're gonna, to, I don't know if this is a series or not. I'm just going to go until the Lord says otherwise. We're going to talk about something that we kind of all know, but we don't know. I find that that tends to be the, the way we've been going since the beginning of the year, touching on things that we have embedded into our culture, but don't fully understand. Or, or, or not seeing the full revelation of. And a lot of times that happens when a doctrine or a principle becomes cultural. It just becomes the way we talk, it just becomes the way we act, it becomes the way we pray, it becomes the way we read, but we, don't, we stop getting revelation. The word of God is alive, because God is alive, and God and the word are the same. So if I'm talking to a living person who is as vast as God, every time I talk to them, I'm sure I should be experiencing some angle that wakes something up in me I hadn't seen before. That's what I expect when I talk to God. When you study the word, that's the Lord speaking to you. And it's confirmed and opened up and revealed by the Holy Spirit in you. So if you read a scripture and you read the same scripture for 10 years and everything you got out of it is 10 years old, something's wrong. Because you should be able to read the same scripture every day for the rest of your life, and it still bring revelation to you. Because the word is alive. Now, it may not be every day. I'm, I'm, I'm making it an extremist, because sometimes you have to labor over the word until revelation comes. And it can be several days before that comes. But the idea being that I know there's more in there. I know there's more in there because God's not dead. You know, if, if you kill a person and you take everything they wrote, you can spend an entire lifetime understanding what they wrote, but you won't get anything new because that person's dead. So everything they wrote is all you got. 
And a lot of believers you treat the word that way. They treat the, the word of God the way Muslims treat the Quran, where, okay, the guy who wrote this is dead, but this is what he left behind, and we're going to argue for the rest of our lives over what he meant when he wrote that. But God's not dead. Jesus is not dead. The Holy Spirit is not dead. They're very much alive. And the whole purpose of the scripture is to draw you into communication with a living God so that he can talk to you. So if you're just reading it and you're not hearing it, and this isn't my lesson for tonight, but it prefaces my lesson. If you're just reading the scripture or getting it taught to you, but you're not hearing it, you, it hasn't come alive to you yet. You haven't heard the word yet. And that's important to understand because when I read, I'm listening in my spirit. Okay, what are you saying today? You might be using the same words in Psalm 23. Those writings haven't changed. But what you're saying to me today can be very different than what you said to me last week or the week before, or the year before, or 10 years before. And that should be your pursuit every time you open your Bible. Sometimes it takes days before you hit it, but you got to keep coming back. Understanding that, okay, I got something really good out of this, and it's been three weeks since I got something out of this. I'm going to go back to it and just see, what does it have for me today? And, and when you read the word like that, the Lord begins to speak and have conversations with you. And that's what you want. You want to be able to converse with God. He's the living God. He's the only God that's alive. People worship dead things as gods all the time, but he is the living God. And that's one of the most important attributes of him, is that he is alive. He didn't stop talking in the last chapter of Revelation. He continues to talk to his people. And any group of people that call themselves Christians who aren't regularly hearing from God are off the path. Because even Jesus said, I only do what I see my father do. He had to get downloaded into him on a daily basis what his path for that day was, what his direction for that day was. He didn't just go on what he heard when he got baptized by John the Baptist and then say, well, now I know my ministry. Now I know everything. I'm just going to go and start doing that until I die. No. He had to get regular revelation in, in case-by-case situations. If, he had, if there's one attribute of Christ that you could, that they're all extremely valuable for your spiritual health, but if I could lock in on one, it would be his hearing, his hearing from God. Because if you can hear from God clearly, you can figure every, you will know everything else. Never let anything get in the way of your hearing. Sometimes preaching gets in the way of your hearing. You hear a message that sounds really good and you just try to copy what you heard from that message and you're not hearing from God. Sometimes it's anger. Somebody, you were driving away your church, you were feeling good, somebody cut you off, now you're mad. Now you can't hear God because you're screaming in your head louder than the Holy Ghost is talking. You know, sometimes it's your kids that keep you from hearing or your spouse that keeps you from hearing or something happening on your job or just anything that I covet and I protect very strongly my hearing. Even naturally, because I'm a music producer, so my hearing is very important, right? So I, I wear earplugs more than most people because I protect my, my ears. I get my hearing checked every year because that's my money maker, right? The number of frequencies that I can hear because I'm an audio engineer as well matters. So I, I protect my ears. I don't stay around loud noises too long and all that good stuff. But spiritually, I do the same thing. If there's one sense that I have to protect, it's my ability to hear the voice of God. Because you can go into a situation and not know what to do, and the, and the Lord can speak to you, and boom, you, you know what to do now. You can get in over your head somewhere, and the Lord can, can talk you out of it. He can instruct you out of it. Or you can be sitting in church or reading your Bible and hear the voice of the Lord say something to you that the person speaking didn't even say. But the Lord, and that's what's been happening to me lately on Sunday mornings. Mom will read something, and she'll be going in one direction, which is great, but then the Lord will say, hold on to that word, and then go study that. And then I go and I study that, and it takes me a whole different direction. That's why I keep going to her scriptures, because every time I'm sitting over here on Sundays, I'm listening. I'm listening to her, and I'm listening to the Holy Ghost. And sometimes I'm, I'm, it's coming to me so fast, because I'm protecting my hearing at all times. I don't ever want to be angry when I come to church. I don't ever want to be uh, sad. If the Lord instructs me to give a certain amount, 
I want to give that amount as soon as possible because I don't want to be sitting on disobedience. I don't want to have money in my pocket that belongs to God or belongs to his people or belongs to a person that he instructed me to give it to. I don't want disobedience to get in the way of my hearing. My hearing is super important. It's the most important, in my opinion, the most important attribute of, of Christ that we can learn from him was his sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So anyway, that is also not my lesson, but I'm hearing and I'm going. We're going to talk about, let's go to Psalms 23. I feel like if I just go ahead and jump into scripture, I'll actually get to my point. And like I said, I don't know if this is a series or not, but we're going to go until the Lord says otherwise. And we're going to go over some very familiar scripture. Psalm 23 is one of those scriptures that even if you're not saved, you think you know it, you've heard it. It's one of the most famous scriptures in the Bible. It's also one of the most misunderstood. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Now I could stop there because no, I'm going to keep reading. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, the house of the Lord represents the presence of the Lord. In, in the Old Testament, the only way you could get into the presence of God is if you were in the temple or the tabernacle of God. The presence of God didn't just show up everywhere. After Moses was commanded to build that tabernacle, that was the only place the presence of God would show up in the world. That was it. The presence of God would not appear anywhere else but, a, but on his people on that place. That's what made it sacred. Then they built the temple. And then Solomon built the temple, but the temple's not built at this point because this is David. And so he knew of the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, which sat in the tabernacle. And so when he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord, he's talking about the presence of God. I will dwell in the presence of God forever. His understanding of the presence of the Lord was, I got to be in his house. I got to go where he will be, and I'll be in his presence. He, we don't have a good understanding of that concept because we've grown up with the Lord living inside of us. Or we're going, we've been around people who were born again and had the, were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they, we carry God around with us. So we don't really appreciate a world where you had to go to a place to get into the presence of God. Because we can spin around in our you know, living room <laughs> and pray down the presence of God or, or enter into the presence of God right there in our house and our car on a ride to work. But David had to travel to a physical location at a certain time under certain conditions just to get a glimpse of the presence of God. So he appreciated it way more than we do. And then if you weren't right when you went in there, you died if you weren't the right person, because not everybody could go in. You had to be a priest just to go in or you die. You just died. Most people, you knew better. There was a, there was a wall, you didn't pass this point, because you die. You, they were all sinners. They were all on their way to hell. <laughs> you couldn't just walk into the presence of God. You die. We don't have a good understanding of that, because we come in here, and Casey sings a couple of songs, and I hit a few nice chords, and we say the presence of God is in the room. And we have no idea what it means to really pursue the presence of God. If you had to get in your car and drive for 18 hours into a desert to go into a tent and wait for however long it took and bring your best sacrifices and sacrifice them and, and, and not eat, you had to fast and pray and wash yourself with water so many times just for the presence of God to come into the room, you'd appreciate it. You'd appreciate it. But God's not holding back on us because we don't appreciate him. 
But we're holding back on him because we don't appreciate him. And because we're drawing away, we're not experiencing his full presence. But David would kill to be one of us. David would kill to be one of us. And we take it for granted. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters, etc., etc. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. We've been in there a little while now. Let's go to verse 16. Now, right now, somebody's thinking, well, what is his actual message about? We're going to get to it. I'm laying all the foundation first. Matthew 6, verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, now he's talking to, he's talking about two types of Christians. He's talking about, this is one teaching, Matthew chapter 6. And the, the primary theme of Matthew chapter 6 is, for whom and to whom are you doing everything that you do that you think is spiritual? If you go back to the first verse of Matthew 6, he's talking about how certain people give in front of other people. They do their alms before men so that people can give them credit, so they can get accolade and recognition for being generous. He says those same people, when they pray, they pray out loud in front of everybody so everybody can see them praying. And when they fast... They, 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 they look real deep and, and tired and drained from their fast to get recognition from people. And Jesus is saying, that's your reward. If that's why you're doing it, that's your reward. So we're at verse 16, chapter 6, Matthew. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites. He calls them hypocrites of a sad countenance or a sad expression. For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, that's their reward. That people will go, oh my God, he's so spiritual. That's, that's it, that's your reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. Put, put some makeup on. That's what, that's what anointing your head was back then. Put some lotion on, put some makeup on, make yourself pretty. I'm trying not to go there. But look. Makeup. Makeup works. Casey said that makeup's not so, she, she's a makeup artist. She told me this a long time ago. She said makeup is not supposed to cover, it's supposed to enhance. That's right. Enhance. <laughs> Ladies, let me tell you, it matters. Enhance. We're not saying you're not beautiful without makeup. If you're ugly without makeup, makeup will not make you pretty but it will enhance beauty if you are beautiful. We don't have any ugly women in here, and only good-looking people follow us online. So this is a general statement you can share with people that you're witnessing to. If you're ugly without makeup, makeup's not going to make you pretty. But if there's a little bit of beauty on your face, makeup will enhance it. Everybody's afraid to say amen, but they know I'm right. They know I'm right. Enhance. That's all I'm going to say. It matters. Married ladies, your man will thank you. And he'll thank you in many ways. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Jesus said, anoint your head. Anoint your head. That's in the Bible. And wash your face. That you may appear not unto men to fast but unto thy father, which is in secret. That's very interesting. He says you want your father to see you fast. You don't want other people to see you fast. You don't want to look like you're fasting in the eyes of other people. But you do want to have that appearance to God. So anointing your head and washing your face while fasting sends a message to God. You've got to read the scripture one word at a time. Don't breeze through stuff. Jesus is making a point here. And we're going to get to that point. Maybe by the end of the night, we're going to get to that point. Because I haven't even given you the title. And I actually have one. Then he goes on. Same message. 
same people, same situation, he's still continuing his preaching. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. That's a promise. That's not a if God feels like it. That's a promise. He says, when he sees your fast in secret. And what makes it a secret? What makes it a secret is that your head is anointed and your face is washed and you're not flaunting it in front of everybody. Yeah, I'm fasting, don't talk to me. Yeah, I'm fasting, I'm, I'm really going through it, y'all. I'm really going through it. You see, most of the times when people fasted back then and even today, most of the times when we fast, we're fasting for a specific need. I've got a financial need or a health need or a familial need. I've got some kind of need and I'm fasting for an answer to that problem. And Jesus said, when you fast, don't go broadcasting, I'm fasting for this problem. I'm going through it, y'all. I'm dealing with it. He said, that's your reward. When you're going through an issue, Jesus, that requires a fast for an answer. Jesus said, make yourself up pretty, wash your face, and don't let nobody know. And that doesn't mean you can't go to church leadership or a brother or sister in Christ that's strong in the faith and had him agree with you. He's not saying just hide it till you die. He's saying don't broadcast your troubles like your God isn't good. What he's saying is array yourself like you're the child of God. Child of God is not going to get, God, I'm walking around with dirt and dust in the hair looking raggedy because they're going through something. A child of God would not ever look that way. Jesus is, a, is changing their mindset about this is how you deal with difficult situations. When you're fasting, look like you're not. I don't want to see you. This is Jesus. I don't want to see you with your head down and a hump in your back and a, and a sad expression like the hypocrites do. Because what makes them hypocritical is they want, they want help, but they also want glory for needing help. If they, if they were out of that situation, they'd have nothing to be sad about. And their sadness is what gets them points with the community. But they also want to be out of that situation. So they're hypocritical. They're double-minded. They're lying. You don't want to be that way. You want to array yourself like a child of God. This is Jesus's, this is the theme. He says, your father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. That's a promise. Whenever he says, this shall happen, that's where, that's where your expectation should be. If I am fasting in secret, my reward will be open. If I, if I follow this, and this is in red in my Bible, that means Jesus said it. These are direct quotes from the man himself. Then he goes on. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust do corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust do corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Now, this scripture has been taken out of context by everybody coming against rich Christians. Because if you're a Christian, or especially if you're a preacher, if you've got a little bit too much money, which no one's ever been able to figure out how much is too much. Because my, my initial argument is, the average middle class American is wealthier than half of the Earth, Earth's population. If you ever go to a third world country, if you got one car and three meals a day, you're richer than half of Africa. You're poor in American standards, but who's too rich? Because if you got two pairs of shoes, that's one pair of shoes too many. You gonna get your second pair of shoes away? Then be quiet. You're rich to somebody, everybody is rich to somebody. And, and everybody saying that preachers shouldn't be rich wouldn't give up their second vehicle to another person. They wouldn't give up their second shirt to a poor man. So it's hypocritical. We can't even establish what, a rich, what rich means, because rich means different in different communities. So you got to figure out how poor is righteous poor, and how rich is unrighteous rich. Nobody has been able to give a good answer for that. But 
this scripture is taken out of context often to come against rich preachers. And most of the time, it's other Christians that do it, that come against them. Because they say they just out there in it for the money. Let me tell you something. This is not the business to be in if you're in it for the money. Because even if you manage to get the money, you got to get all the persecution from having it. And you really don't want that. When a doctor gets rich, nobody gets mad. When a lawyer gets rich, nobody gets mad. When a politician gets rich, some people get mad. Most people don't. If you own a real estate company and you make a lot of money, nobody gets mad at you. Unless you're Donald Trump. Nobody's mad at you if you do anything but preach and get rich. So if you got into this business for the money, go do something else and get rich. Then you can be rich and people will like you. That sounds fair. And there are some people who get into this for the money. I'm not saying that's not true. It's just not smart. There are easier ways <laughs> to get rich and have people like you. You know, you can be a drug dealer, and if you survive long enough to become a rapper, people will forget that you used to sell crack to people. And eventually, they'll call you a mogul and an icon, and they'll put your face on murals and, and call you a, a, a great citizen of the United States, and you'll get to endorse presidential candidates, and people will forget that you sold crack to get there. So, I'm not telling anybody to go sell crack. I'm just saying there's easier ways to get rich than this if that's why you're in it. Now, there's no better way to, to attain the wealth of God than being where God puts you. This is not a poor man's profession. The, the, the preaching the gospel is not supposed to be a poor man's profession. But you get a lot of warfare when you do it this way. And most people don't understand that. Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth. He didn't say don't lay up treasure on earth. The two key words here is treasure and heart. He said, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. He said, don't put your heart and your money on earth. That's all he's saying. He's not saying don't get rich. It's not even about money. He doesn't use the word money here. He uses the word treasure. Because you can treasure other things than money. Some people broke as a joke, but they're so in love with their kids that their kids turn into hellions and they don't know, they don't know what to do because they let them get away with everything. You ever met somebody like that? That's their treasure. Some people have a car that they treasure. They, they, that car is spotless every time you see it. Nothing wrong with taking care of your stuff. Take care of your stuff. But some people put their car before the Lord. Some people put their kids before the Lord. Some people put their job before the Lord, their spouse before the Lord. Jesus said treasure. He didn't say money. He said, don't have a treasure on the earth that's more important to you than the treasure, than what you treasure in heaven. That's why he said treasure and not money. He said, because all that stuff will rust out. Somebody can come and steal your treasure. Then he goes on to talk about money. The light of the body. See, here's the thing I love about Jesus, and I'm trying to get to my message title. Now, I'm in my message, but I ain't got to the point yet. What I love about Jesus is he is, and at this time was, a brilliant orator. He could make a case, and you had to follow him all the way through to, to get it. Because what we do is we take scriptures, take this piece, and we try to understand that piece, but you got to read the whole thing, man. Him and the Apostle Paul, I love to read when they were writing. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Now the word single there is translated as focused, looking at the same thing. You got, a, you got two eyes. If they're pointing in the same direction and focused, you can see. So when you see that word single, it means you got one eye. It means if both your eyes got one purpose, one focus. If your eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, now the opposite of single is divided. So he's saying if your vision is divided, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. 
If therefore the light that is in you be divided, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, the word despise means to make little of, to make low, to treat lowly or lesser than. You can despise something by just putting it below its value, devaluing it, disrespecting it, whatever word you want to use. That's what despise means. It doesn't mean you won't use it. It just means you won't honor it. You can despise your boss at your job, but that person's signing your checks, so you put up with them. You can make low of your spouse. You can despise your spouse, but if they're the ones working, you expect them to bring the money home. Or if they're the ones at home taking care of the house, you expect them to do that. Or if both of y'all work and have your house is set up, you have requirements for your spouse that you expect, and you don't have to respect them. You can despise something. Doesn't mean you've kicked it out of the equation. This is a mistake a lot of us make. We say, well, I don't despise God. I include him in everything. Well, I, you can include somebody in something. That doesn't mean you don't despise them. You can include somebody that isn't the same as serving them. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. He said you can have two masters, but you can't serve them both. He said because one you're going to love, one you're going to despise. They can both be there. They can both be vying for your attention, but you got to pick one for love and one to despise. And a lot of times we think because we acknowledge to a degree God that we love him. But I can show you who you love real quickly. And you can see in yourself, do I despise God or do I love him? Which master is God? Now, he said you can't serve God and mammon. Mammon has been translated consistently as money or a little deeper translation as the spirit, the evil spirit that controls greed and lust for money. The word mammon is an old word going back to the Syrians some 2,500 years ago or more. And it's been translated through the Greek and the Aramaic and the Hebrew, and it's maintained a certain uh, consistency in its definition. In some translations, it's just the word money. It just means you can't serve God and money, and that's true. But some translations take it a little farther and say it's the, it's the name of the spirit that guides greed and people who chase after money and, and unclean wealth. You cannot serve God and mammon. The spirit of mammon wants you to serve it. So then Jesus says this. Therefore I say unto you. Now, therefore means, based on what I just said, here's the point. If you start a scripture with the word therefore, you have to read the scriptures previous to it. You cannot begin a statement with therefore. If I walk into a room and I say, therefore, you don't know, I'm in the middle of a thought. You don't begin a new thought with therefore. You continue a previous thought with therefore. That's just common English, my best subject in school, grammar and literature. You do not begin a fresh thought with therefore. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Jesus is making 
a very powerful and profound statement that we breathe over. He said, you can't serve God and mammon. You can't love God and mammon. Because you can't love God and mammon, take no thought for your life. That was deeper than the reaction I got. <laughs> because you cannot serve God and mammon, because you cannot love God and mammon, you can't love them both, take no thought for your life. You see, mammon is more than just the spirit of greed. That's not how he most commonly uh, reveals himself in your life. Mammon reveals himself most commonly as worry, as concern about money. Because what he does is he gets you to value money higher than its place should be in your life. So then, if there isn't enough of it, you place, because of the value you place on it, you worry about it. I'm taking a moment here for dramatic effect. Most of my amens are coming from JJ in the back. But that's all right. That's just because it's, it's hitting you. It's going to hit you on the ride home. I'm not worried about it. It hit me like a ton of bricks. Mammon is the spirit of worry about finances, just as much as he's the spirit of greed. Remember what Jesus started this, this, this train of thought on. He said, when you fast, don't look sad about it. Don't have a sad countenance. Don't have a, a, a distraught appearance. He said, anoint your head. Wash your face. Straighten your back out. Don't let everybody know you're going through something. Why? Because as the child of God, God is responsible for meeting your need. If you walk around lowly and broken because you have a need, you're telling people that mammon is a better God than God. Because if I had more mammon, I would be happy. I have lots of God, but I'm not happy. See, when you fast, you're supposed to pray. If you spend a week praying, and you're less happy than you were the week before, you're praying to the wrong God. So what you're telling people is, the more time I spend with God, the sadder I get. And it's a bad representation of God. That's why Jesus said what he said. When you serve mammon, you serve mammon by worry, not just by chasing money. Most Christians don't realize they're serving mammon because they don't think they're greedy. They say, I'm not chasing money. I'm not robbing. I'm not stealing. I'm sticking to this one job even though it ain't paying enough, and I'm, I'm doing the best I can. There's no way I'm serving mammon. I go to church every Sunday. I tithe. I give a little offering. I even put a little something extra whenever they need something. I'm serving God. I'm not serving mammon. But when the light bill's a little overdue or the rent's a little overdue, you start worrying. You're serving mammon. A servant of God never worries. How do I know? How do I know? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap. He said they don't sow and reap. We sow and reap. They don't even do that. They don't gather into barns. They don't do any kind of farming or agriculture. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? He says the birds don't even do what we do for food. The father just gives it to them. He says, are you not better than birds? 
When you worry about money, you are telling God and you are telling everyone else that God don't even treat me better than the birds. He treat the birds better than me. You ever seen a skinny bird? You ever seen a starving bird? No. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature or can prolong his life? Which of you, by taking thought, can prolong his life? And why are you taking thought for clothing? That's what Raymond is. Why are you taking thought for clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the book of Matthew. He said, consider the lilies of the field. How they grow. They toil not. Neither do they spin. Spinning with how you made uh, thread for clothing. They don't do anything to make their own clothing. They don't toil. They don't spin yarn or thread. Nothing. And yet I say unto you, and this is Jesus talking. This is Jesus. You ain't got to believe me, but you got to believe Jesus. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if you don't know anything about Solomon, you need to look up Solomon. Richest king in the history of mankind. So beautiful in all of his wealth that other kings would travel just to see him, just to look at how rich he was. They didn't have nothing to do with him. They just wanted to see how rich he was. His home, his palace was an attraction for people to come see. He was so rich. And Jesus says that a flower is arrayed better than Solomon was in all his glory. Because God made the flower. Now, he made Solomon rich. But he did a better job with the flower, Jesus said. Want to prove it? We still buy flowers today and put them all over our house to make our houses beautiful. We don't know what Solomon's house looked like. We have some descriptions of it in the Bible, but we can't really accurately reproduce it. It was beautiful. It was grand. But we get fresh flowers every year that are so beautiful, especially when you see a whole field of them. It takes your breath away. My wife loves sunflowers. I like sunflower seeds because I can eat it. (laughs) But she loves sunflowers, so I have to buy them regularly because that's her favorite flower. They're beautiful. But I, they're not my favorite. I feel like they're better as food. But it's not my house. I just live there and pay for everything. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven for fire, shall he not much more clothe you. He said, is your faith that small? And we, we learned how faith comes. It comes from the knowledge of God, right? The more I know about, the more, the more of God I know, I just know about, but the more of God I know, the more, my, more faith I have. We, we learn of God from his word, which is why faith comes by hearing the word. We know that. I ain't got time to go with all of that. Watch the Believers Convention. He taught it. He says much more He doesn't just say he'll do the same for you. He said Solomon was the richest king in the world. The flowers look better than Solomon, and God will do much more for you than he does for the flowers. That's not just a statement about provision. That's a statement about standard. This is God's standard of provision. When God takes care of you, you'll be even better arrayed than the flowers who were better arrayed than Solomon. So you shouldn't get mad at rich preachers because they have big pretty houses and big pretty cars and big pretty planes because they're just doing better than the flowers. This is God's standard. When God takes care of you, you anoint your head with oil, you wash your face, you stand up straight because my God supplies my need. See, this is all one long thought. It's not just It's not separate messages broken up. The whole chapter 6 of Matthew is talking about 
how you represent God, especially in times of need. Because this is where we misrepresent him the most. When we have a need, we look like it and we act like it. That's how you serve mammon. Because what you start doing, I want you to, let's, let's get a little more practical. What's the first thing you do when you have a financial need? Maybe not the first thing, because y'all, y'all more spiritual than this, but what do most people do, the first, the first thing they do when they have a financial need? Who knows? Who thinks they know? Raise your hand. If you think you know the first thing somebody does when they have a financial need, they panic. They go get a loan. They call somebody. They get mad. That's true. What's the first thought? I mean, let me make it a little more specific. What's one of the first thoughts you have when you have a financial need? How can I get it? Failure. Okay, nobody's getting it, Lord. They're all giving right answers. I'm going to tell you what you do and you don't realize it. You think about somebody who doesn't have your problem. Every single one of you compares yourself to somebody else. If you lived in a poor neighborhood, some of you grew up in poor neighborhoods where everybody was poor and you didn't know any rich people, did you feel poor? Be honest. <laughs> you, know, you might have been poorer than everybody else. <laughs> Without a comparative standard, you didn't know how poor you were. Most poor people I know or know about don't realize how poor they are. If, you, if all you've ever eaten was government cheese, real cheese is weird to you because you don't have a comparison. If you never had a car that worked, the first time you see a new car or get in a new car, you don't know how to act. Most poor people, if they, all they know is poverty, they don't feel poor. They, they can feel bad about where they are, but they don't feel poor because you don't know poor unless you can compare it to something, right? You don't know thirst unless you can compare it to being hydrated. You don't know pain unless you felt pleasure. You have to know the other side to understand where you are in comparison to it, right? When you have a financial need, your first thought is usually, if I had a million dollars, man. Because there's people that have a million dollars. What you're doing, and I, I'm not trying to put a heavy on anybody, because the Lord is developing this in me as well. When you have those thoughts, what you're actually saying is, if God was better to me, I'd be happier. Now, it's not wrong to dream. It's not wrong to have a vision for better than where you are. But the vision should come from God and from your knowledge of how good God is. It should not be a comparison of God to mammon. See, when the world gets rich, they flaunt it. When the world gets rich, they show off how rich they are, and they don't give God glory for it. They give mammon glory for it. They use words like hustle. They use words like street smarts, business smarts, book smarts, the grind. They use those terminologies to glorify human effort towards wealth. That's mammon. Nothing wrong with work. God requires work. But he doesn't require toil. And there's a difference between work and toil. And I don't have a lot of time left, so I can't get into it. So I guess this is a series now. It took me so long to get here. But you see, when you make a comparison to from where you are to where somebody else is, it's not your situation you're comparing. It's your God you're comparing. You're saying there's two options here, and my option's not doing as well as that rapper's option, or that actor's option, or that social media influencer's option. Nothing wrong with having a dream and having a goal. But see, when it comes from God, it drives you to further fellowship with God. It makes you go, oh, you have that for me too? I want that. Nothing wrong with wanting more. You should want more. If you have everything in life that you ever wanted, get bigger. Want more. That's not greed. It's you developing more 
into your understanding of God. Because God's so big, he didn't give you just this little stamp sized piece of land and say, that's for you. You'll be happy. You can't. You ever been to somebody's house that was so much better than yours? And you look around and you go, I want, I want this. Two things happen. One of two things happen. You go back to your God and you say, Lord, I like that. And I know you're a good God and you'll give that to me. So I'm a, show me how you want me to have that from you. That's the right way. The other way is mammon. Mammon, I like that. How many more jobs I got to work? How hard I got to grind? Who I got to step on to get that? Each one of them will give you an answer. But you can't do them both. You can't love them both. You can't serve them both. And a lot of times, us being good Christians, we do this right here. Well, I'm not going to step on nobody. I'm not going to rob nobody. And I'm not going to work myself into the ground. I'm going to trust God. So, so, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. And then God gives you an instruction. That's, he says, all right, give everything you got in your savings account into this project the church got going on. Well, Lord, I don't know if that's you. I'm going to keep on trusting you. I know what I'll do. I'll give half of it. I'll give half. Boom. Here you go, Pastor. I'll give you half. You're not giving us anything, by the way. You're giving it to the Lord or you're not giving it at all. If you're not giving it to the Lord, keep it in your pocket. Because giving it to us don't do nothing for you. Just so you know. But here you go, rapture, or whatever church you go to that you should be in tonight if they got a Bible study. Here's half my savings. That's the Ananias and Sapphira thing. We got this much. We promised this much, but we're going to say we only got this much, and we're going to give you this. So then we give you that. I'm trusting God, though. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not cheating or lying or stealing or stepping on nobody. I'm not doing the, the grind thing. I'm standing with the Lord. Then the bills come due, and you don't have enough. And Mammon's over there going, what you going to do, man? And you go, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do. That thought, that's Mammon. That's Mammon saying, see, man, if you grind a little harder, you wouldn't have this problem. See, man, if you would have, if you would have, went to that school instead of, instead of staying in church, you wouldn't have had this problem. God's not doing for you what I would have done for you by now. That's mammon. Mammon will come back and rub your old need in your face and tell you, God ain't going to do this for you, man. God, God, all that sowing and tithing and all that stuff, that, don't, that ain't it, man. Mammon will make you feel inadequate for not having what he says you should have. God tells you, you have everything because you have me. The more of me you have, the more of everything I have, you have. And I'll lead you to it. I'll, I'll guide you to it. I'll, I'll direct you to it. And I'll give you the grace to walk in it without toil. Mammon can't promise you that. But mammon will try to make you feel bad Every time your light bill come due. Got to be mindful of mammon. Now, I still didn't get to the title of my message. You got to come back next week because I'm out of time tonight. We're just getting started. I didn't get to any of my bullet points either. All that was just scripture. In closing, you cannot serve two masters. Whoever is your master, you're responsible to their way of doing things. Mammon shows up as worry and then turns into greed, which is why most people don't realize it's mammon. Now, we're going to dissect it a little bit more next week because I don't want to put any heavy on anybody if they feel like they got to work a little bit more because God's not against work. God is a pro-work God. He's an anti-lazy pro-work God. So we're going to get into that a little bit more. I'm going to leave you on that cliffhanger so you don't feel bad going to work tomorrow. Because I don't want nobody making a doctrine saying, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to serve God. No, don't do that on my, don't, don't say I said that. Anyway, <laughs> let's go home. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the path that you have us on to develop us spiritually. That we not create wrong and religious doctrines based on need and suffering, but rather understand through relationship and fellowship with you better how much you love us and how good you are. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness being revealed in our lives every day and in every way, Lord, as we open up to you and your goodness. 
including your promise of divine protection, which we receive right now, according to Psalms 91, that your angels are charged over us to keep us in all our ways, and they do bear us up in their hands, lest we dash our foot against the stone. I thank you, that we are divinely protected from all hurt, harm, danger, injury, death, damage, sickness, disease, or any such thing that the devil may try to put against us until we come together again on Sunday to praise, to worship, to give, and to be fed the word in an uncompromising and powerful way. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for watching this broadcast. Now, we don't want you to miss when we go live again. So sign up for Rapture Go. Text the Rapture to 797979. Again, it's the word Rapture to 797979. We'll send you a text message the very next time we go live.